So prior to this, we've been kind of looking at the action that Hitler has been taking um, and the response of the international community. Now we're seeing this like aggressiveness become very accelerated now towards the path of war. Um, and so now in this next lecture, we're going to be looking at that response from the international community towards Hitler. Um, so on September 1st, Nazi troops entered Poland. This is, you know, a clear sign of war, but the British and the French basically gave Hitler an ultimatum demanding that Germany would draw their troops from the region. Germany ignored, obviously, because what, what are they going to do? The same thing that they've been doing before, which is just not really doing anything. Um, so they ignored it. Hitler ignored it. Uh, the Polish crisis officially became the European war. By the end of September, Poland had been divided between Germany and the Soviet Union. One reason uh, Germany was able to defeat Poland was so fast was because of the Blitzkrieg, um, which is, I'm just going to call it the Lightning War, which combined air warfare uh, with the use of tanks. The strategy destroyed the Polish railways and the air force, uh, despite the brave fight that the Polish put up. Uh, during the interwar period, the U.S. supported neutrality uh, when it came down to conflict in Europe and just in general, remember when we were in our Japan chapter, the United States kind of was a neutral. And despite the fact that the British were saying like, hey, how about now? Can you help us now? The US was like, no, we're just gonna lay back. Um, and remember they weren't part of the League of Nations. There was all this tension growing in the Pacific, but as well in Europe and the US just stayed neutral. Eventually under the Neutrality Act was, you know, basically modified under President Roosevelt. Um, in 1939, November, basically lifting that embargo that allows aggressive con uh, countries to so that they can now buy materials for them. So embargo is lifted under the Neutrality Act. Aggressive countries that are basically aggressive countries just means like war country countries that are like engaging in war or like fighting. Um, this was more geared towards the French and the UK, though. All right. Uh, war in Europe from September 1939 to 1940. Following the surrender of the Soviet, uh, sorry, of uh, Poland, the Soviet Union took over the Baltic states and invaded Finland, um, as stated in the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Outside of that, not much really happened between this period of time, between the period of uh, when basically Germany goes into Poland up until April 1940. Not much is happening except for, um, well, this is known as the phony war. And the only thing that really happened was Germany just taking Denmark, Norway, in an attempt to access the Swedish iron through Norway. Um, aside from that, these victories also gave Hitler access to the sea corridor from Denmark to southern Norway. Uh, um, this has a ripple effect, right? And this is going to impact other countries. The UK, this impacted the UK politically. So Chamberlain, remember, he was the guy that was negotiating all of these things. Remember Rhineland? Um, trying to appease, remember that word, to do that appeasement strategy with Hitler, uh, Rhineland, uh, Czechoslovakia, remember the promises he made, and remember um, Austria, all of that. So obviously what he's doing isn't being seen as effective. Um, and so he's replaced by Winston Churchill, this guy right here with the little peace sign and right here with a top hat. Um, this elimination, this eliminated basically any hope that Hitler had in negotiating with with the British now that Churchill has stepped in and Chamberlain was not because basically you want to you want to look at it as Hitler was kind of doing whatever he wanted to do under Chamberlain now is that going to happen under Churchill absolutely not all right so at the same time as things are changing in Great Britain Germany launched a blitzkrieg or lightning war um, attack on Hol uh, Holland and Belgium. It didn't take long for Holland and Belgium to basically surrender for them because, again, the strategy is working out well. Um, Germany has a pretty strong military at this point, um, and they're using it very effectively with that strategy. Um, the British and the French troops that were in the area become trapped, and so this just obviously you have a, a chunk of your military trapped in a certain region it's not good for and you know those that side of uh the fighting all right so next part the fall of france and remember just pause if you need to uh finish writing certain things so now we see what's going on with france additionally the nazis entered uh, france through uh 
the Ardennes, I don't know how to say that, mountains, figure out how to say it and let me know. So they enter through their mountains. France surrenders on June 22nd, 1940. It, again, it did not take long. Ger Germany's making all of these moves. They're invading all of these areas and they're being pretty successful in these invasions. Um, with the invasion of France, Germany was able to take control over the northern part of France. This gave them access to some marine bases along the coastline of the Atlantic. This opens up for great strategy. I mean, why wouldn't you know? Just why wouldn't you want these military bases and access to these military bases? It grow in strength, right? A puppet government was established under the German supervision. Um, so basically, they everything that was all the shots that were being called in France during this time was approved and or driven or established or whatever you want to say by Hitler's government, which is Germany, right? Um, the general Charles de Gaulle, who basically became exiled, who was anti-Nazi, who was, you know, trying to defend France. He's at the, things, at the same time, he's encouraging his citizens or the citizens of France to basically resist any German occupation during this time. So all of these things are happening. All of these people are falling. France is falling. And it's like, holy crap, what is going on? This guy is, you know, he's winning. He's he looks like this is going to be a, the thing, right? It's going to be it. Um, and we can't forget about this guy, Mussolini. So although Italy was determined to fight, there was not, they were not as ready to enter the war as Germany was. Hence, there was that hesitation for from Mussolini. Um, and remember, their their economy and his like economic policies are failing, and he has he has that whole situation with Abyssinia. Um, Italy didn't declare war until June tenth, nineteen forty, when they saw France basically on the verge of falling. So it's kind of like one of you think about it this way, you know, when you guys do group projects. And then there's always that one person who doesn't do anything, but then comes in at the very last minute to kind of do the easy part. Think of Mussolini that way, in that sense, that he didn't enter the war until he saw that. It's like, oh my God, okay, it's almost over. Maybe I should come in and like maybe get some recognition and some glory too, because I can't all go to, to Hitler because, you know, Loki, he was a little bit jealous of Hitler, um, which is stated right here. In, in its own words, another reason he entered was because he wanted to keep up pace with Hitler and not be seen as a junior partner. Remember, Mussolini was first. He came first. And basically, Hitler said that he learned a lot under Mussolini and was inspired by him. And, you know, Mussolini wanted to be seen like as this, like, the top dog in Europe, like the leader in Europe. Didn't work out because he's a big failure in that sense. And I don't think he enjoys the fact that he is seeing this guy who comes after him or like right after him, um, who's, I think, younger at least, being extremely successful in all of these areas and invading all of these. I mean, he took down France. Um, I don't know how difficult it would have been for Italy to do that, but obviously it, Hitler did it and Mussolini didn't. Um, and you'll see some of these failures highlighted here. So Italy enters the war. Now that they're officially into the war, um, they go into Egypt in, on September 1940, and they try to invade Egypt from their Italian colony in Libya. A month later, he attacks Greece. And so he's trying to do his own thing too, which, you know, gaining control, gaining territories as well, just like Hitler is. However, um, Mussolini was unsuccessful in both of these attacks. The British basically drove out Mussolini and, well, Italy out of Egypt, sunk their Italian fleet, occupied Crete, Crete and, uh, which is an island in Greece. Uh, Greece was also able to drive out Italy out of their country. Basically, failure, right? Failure. Economic policies that we looked over under uh, Italy, failure. And now this next section of him trying to do the same thing or a very similar thing as Hitler is failing as well. Uh, this basically showed the world that uh, Mussolini was absolutely not ready or Italy was not ready to fight in any war. Um, the Battle of Britain, next part, and I think this almost, we're almost done. Um, Britain was left as the only power standing against Germany in Europe. Germany turns their focus into focus on Britain. Um, launching a preliminary bombing campaign to destroy the British Royal Air Force, RAF, RAF 
um, between July and September 1940. Basically, by going in preliminary just means like they're going to go attack before they get attacked. They're going to do like um, a strike first, catch them off guard or just kind of like hit them first before they can get hit. Um, they were hoping that by doing this, they would destroy their airfields, radar bases, anything of importance that would give them strength or an advantage over Germany. Um, if they were successful in doing this, they would have control over the English Channel, which would make it a lot easier for them to either one, invade the British or Great Britain, or two, have Great Britain surrender because they were being extremely stubborn and were not surrendering. Um, later, Germany bombed major, sorry, ger sorry, I got a notification. Later, Germany bombed major cities to destroy their industrial capacity and infrastructure. Again, they're trying to do all of these things, bombing these places. And you can see in the pictures, great devastation in the cities. Um, but both of these plans were not successful at all since Germany was unable to invade or unable to get the British to surrender. None of this worked. So historiography, I just want to go over this because it's really important to kind of look at these perspectives of how we interpret the outbreak of war. We're done with the chapter. Now it's kind of looking at who who is more responsible, who's right, what are the different perspectives, um, and we can break them down and we can have some agreement in multiple ones, not just one. So the first one, um, the first interpretation that you see from some historians is that Nazism had a very aggressive foreign policy. They were basically sol the solely responsible for the outbreak of large scale war, um, a war that had been planned by Hitler from the start. So basically this mentality or this perspective is saying Hitler knew what he was doing. Hitler wanted this war. He had planned for it. You can read it in Mein Kampf, or you can see in his actions earlier, in his speech, er, or in his earlier speeches, all of these things, right? Um, that's one perspective. The next perspective, and we've gone over this perspective as well, Hitler did not plan the war. Um, this expansion of Germany was more of Hitler taking advantage of the circumstances that presented um, themselves to him. So remember, the League of Nations was not really doing much, right? They were just kind of like whatever, um, or like very band-aid-like solutions or responding very late. Hitler was going to take advantage of that. That was a circumstance Hitler could take advantage of that. When he sees that, he goes into these places um, like Rhineland and they're not doing anything to him. Why wouldn't he want to take advantage of these other circumstances, right? Um, a lot of instability outside or the fact that he is able to kind of take control and do a lot with Germany. He's taking advantage of these things. And so that's one perspective is he didn't plan for this, but when he saw the opportunity, he took it. The next one is Hitler didn't um, only want to expand for territorial reasons. Um, some people think that that's his main motivation was just he just wants more territory for Germany. Um, no, his power in Germany was unstable and which for which forced him to basically look for success in foreign policy to strengthen his rule, to show off to the people and say, hey, look, like I know things are not that great right now and we're like in, you know, very unstable right now. But look at what I'm doing out there for us and I'm being very successful. Um, do you love me now? And a lot of people bought into that and were like, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Germany number one. Ha ha ha. You know, type of stuff. Um, remember, Mussolini did the same thing, right? His economic policies failed. Um, I think it was the Lira and I can't remember the grain policy for the Lira and the grain. Um, those policies that he implemented for the economy of Italy failed. And so he needed to find a way to kind of like maintain his power. And so, boom, Abyssinia happens, you know? Um, and then the last one is they're not putting the blame so much on Hitler, but they're putting the blame on the policy of appeasement. Um, the idea that these negotiations that happened that just kind of gave everything to Hitler um, was the thing that encouraged Hitler to keep going. Because if he's just going to get all of these things without any like pushback or any resistance or any consequences, why wouldn't he? And so that, I mean, for me, I would link um number one with number four and you know or number two and four like you can link all of these things together in one way or another i think they all have some truth to it um and i think it's important that, that you guys take these interpretations and link them back to some of the things that we've been learning to find like evidence to support that okay um so with that being said that's the last slide 
Um, thank you so much. I'll see you guys next semester.